Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to two player game, Kinfire Delve Calluses Lab, designed by Kevin Wilson and published by Incredible Dream, who helped sponsor this video. In a world where darkness is spreading, you and your fellow seekers have been entrusted with lanterns of kinfire to light the way as you delve into old forgotten wells to find and defeat the evil masters they hide before they unleash their terrors onto the world. Kinfire Delve has several standalone sets that provide you with new seekers to play and challenges to face. And if you combine two sets together, you can play with up to four players. In this video, we're going to learn the two-player game using Callus's Lab. But the rules to this game will cover the rules found in these other sets as well. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, find the master cards, which all have this back. During the game, you'll be trying to survive a journey deep into a well past various traps and monsters to find the master and defeat it. These represent three different versions of the master you might find. Flip them face down, shuffle, and then deal one of them onto the table, returning the other two unseen back to the box. In this way, each time you play, you won't be sure which version of the master is on the other side. Nearby, set the game's six-sided dice and what are known as the progress tokens. Collect a total value of 10 progress tokens, and as instructed here, put them on the master's card. The cards with this back make up the well deck, which you shuffle and set face down nearby. You then deal one face up by each side of the master's face down card, so it looks like this when you're done. If it's your first game, they instead recommend you go through the well deck and find these four cards specifically to arrange around the master, shuffling the well deck after. I'm going to use what I already dealt as they'll help with examples I want to share later. Next, you put three unseen cards from the well deck into a face down discard pile. Any cards added here later will also go face down. The cards with this back make up the exhaustion deck, which you'll shuffle and also put face down. You'll find four double-sided cards known as gauntlets. Put these in a pile with their side face up that shows this edged border. Now each player selects one of the included seekers to use during the game. Each comes with a character card, lantern, and deck of 18 skill cards. The players flip their character cards face up and then deal themselves an opening hand based on this chart found in the rulebook. Again, if you have two sets of Kinfire Delve, you can play with up to four players. We have two players, so each will draw seven cards from their personal deck. Next, put this health die nearby set to its 10 side. Now pick someone to be the first player, and that's the setup. In Kinfire Delve, whether playing with this Callus's Lab set or one of the other boxes, you and the other player will be using the cards in your hand to progress through challenges, descend down the well and get to the bottom in order to find the master and defeat it. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and then going clockwise around and around the table. On your turn, you'll pick any one of the cards surrounding the face down master to interact with. Most are known as challenges, which come in four different types, obstacles, puzzles, traps, and combat. Interacting with a challenge means attempting to overcome it by adding these progress tokens to it. If you add a total value less than the difficulty here, you suffer the penalty in this area. But if you add an amount equal to or greater than that value, you succeed and gain the reward in this area. Succeeding removes the card and then a new one takes its place. In this way, you'll be removing cards from around the master, working your way down through this well deck until it's empty, which will cause this central card to flip over, revealing the master that you'll then need to defeat. So again, to begin a player's turn, they pick one of the four cards surrounding the master to interact with. But first they check to see if any have bolded text like this. If so, this is a rule that will apply as long as that card is in play. For example, this rule says that progress cannot be added to any non-guardian challenge. Well, that's a problem. As long as this is in play, it means we can't add progress tokens to any of the other cards, so we'll pick this challenge to attempt on our turn. When attempting a challenge, you perform four steps. First, the current player picks any one card from their hand to play as an action if they want. 
This part is optional. You can still attempt the challenge without playing a card, but we will in this case. The cards you play must match the color of the border around the challenge card you're attempting. The color is also shown here with a symbol to assist people with trouble distinguishing colors. So as an example, I couldn't play this when attempting the challenge since it's red and the challenge is blue. This one here could work though because it's blue like the challenge. Some skills you play will show more than one color and if so, it can be used when attempting a challenge matching either of them. So I could use this here against this blue challenge or against the green one. If a card is white, it can be used as either red, green, or blue. So I can use it in this challenge. Just be aware, anytime a card can be used as more than one color, you must pick which color it will represent when you play it. For this challenge, we'll play this capture rune card from our hand as an action. The value showing in its top corner here is how much progress it assigns to the challenge. Three in this case. However, you'll also notice a symbol showing here. If we look at the character card for Valera, the seeker currently taking their action, it says for each of these symbols you play as an action or boost, and we'll learn about boosts later, you may add one progress to any challenge not currently being attempted. You resolve this effect as soon as the related card has been played. So although we're attempting this challenge, we would first get to put a progress token on another challenge. Well, except that as we saw, this Guardian's bolded effect is ongoing and says that no progress can be added to any non-Guardian challenge. So that's foiling us right now, but now you know how Valor's ability would otherwise work. And to summarize, the first step of attempting a challenge is to play a skill card as an action from your hand if you want. The next step of attempting a challenge is also optional but can only be performed if the current player did assign a skill card against the challenge. If so, other players can now boost the action up to two times total. So in a two-player game, that means only the other player can boost up to two times. With three or four players, the other players divide the two total boosts among themselves. But in a game with only one seeker, in other words, when you're playing the game on your own, then you can boost your own actions up to two times. So you can only boost your own actions in a game with only one seeker. To boost, you play a card from your hand. In our example, we'll say the other player chooses to boost once playing this card. When boosting, you ignore every part of the card except the very bottom section here. The color it shows in this area must match the challenge card currently being attempted, and you'll notice this color might be different from the ones showing when the card is played as an action. This one has white at the very bottom, which we know can represent red, blue, or green. So this card can be played to boost and will add the value showing here as additional progress to the selected challenge. But also note this symbol. If we refer to the other player's character card, it explains that when their Seeker Roland's boost provides this symbol. The Seeker they are boosting, Valera in this case, immediately draws a card. So they do that now. And just remember, when you play a card for its boost effect, you ignore everything else on the card and only look at the symbols and values at its bottom, unless the card says otherwise. Okay, between the card played as an action and the card played as a boost, we've generated a total of five progress. But we need eight. That means we're still three short. That brings us to step three of attempting a challenge. We roll dice. Here, you must collect all four dice and roll them. These three dice each have two sides showing each of the three colors, while this die is half white and half black. After rolling, each die that matches the color of the challenge that you're attempting adds one extra progress. If you roll a black on this die, it doesn't add any progress, but rolling a white, just like a white on a card, counts as red, blue, or green. So this would add progress as well. Now I'll just remind you, when attempting a challenge, you can choose to play a card from your hand as an action, but you don't have to. If you do, other players can boost you a total of up to two times by playing cards from their hand. But if you don't play an action, they can't boost you. That said, rolling dice is not optional. You can attempt a challenge and skip playing a card, and therefore no boost could be played, and you skipped straight to just rolling the dice but you must roll the dice. Also be aware, if an effect allows or causes you to re-roll the dice, 
all four must be re-rolled. Well, now it's time for the final step of a challenge. You either complete or fail it. Here you total all the progress gained from cards played and dice rolled in this challenge. In our case, three plus two plus one, two more for a total of seven. You now place that value in progress tokens on the challenge. And if the total amount of progress there is less than the difficulty value printed here, the challenge attempt has failed. You then resolve any fail attempt printed here. Anytime you're required to resolve this symbol, the value beside it is how much health you lose. One in this case. The players share a starting health of 10, or 8 if you're playing on hard mode. And anytime you lose health, you adjust the value on this die. If this value ever hits less than 1, the players immediately lose. There are a few effects that might allow you to regain health, but not many. And you can never have more health than the amount you started the game with. Always be sure to read the effects on the cards you play, though. For example, since we're attempting this challenge by playing Capture Rune, it says that you ignore any penalty if you fail a combat challenge. Either way, after resolving the effect of failing a challenge, if necessary, the challenge remains in place, with the progress tokens you'd placed on it so far. In this way, it will be easier to succeed in the future. In this case, it means we'd only have to add one or more progress the next time we attempt this challenge to meet or exceed this requirement. If you attempt a challenge and end with an equal or higher amount of progress on it than its difficulty value, the attempt is a success and you receive the reward, if any, showing in this area. This symbol means that you delve downward five times. Anytime you delve downward, move that number of cards from the top of the well deck to its discard pile, keeping them unseen face down. This is a common reward for succeeding at challenges and will help you get through the well deck quicker so you can reveal the master you're attempting to find and defeat. We aren't going to go through every symbol you'll find on rewards and penalties in this game, but all of them are explained on the back of the rulebook so you can refer here when playing. Once a challenge's reward has been resolved, you then remove all the progress tokens from it, returning them to the supply, and set that challenge face down in a separate completed challenges pile. Don't accidentally put it in the discard, it belongs in its own pile. Whether you fail or succeed at a challenge, when it's over, each player discards any actions or boosts they played into their own personal face-up discard piles. As the final step of a player's turn, they check to see if there are fewer than four face-up well cards. If so, new ones are drawn from the top of the well deck to replace any that were missing. Once the board is refilled, your turn ends and play passes to the person on your left. And with that, we've covered attempting challenges. But there are other ways challenges can be resolved. As we saw, Valora's character ability allows her to place progress on a challenge that's not currently being attempted. So you could be in the middle of attempting one challenge, and then this effect could cause you to add progress to another challenge and complete it. If so, you pause and resolve the completed challenge, then go back to resolving the action you were previously performing. Though, I'll mention, if the reward on a completed challenge would provide a seeker with a benefit, the player currently taking their turn earns that benefit, even if it was another player's effect that caused the challenge to be completed. Here's another way to deal with challenges that you should be aware of. Some effects, like this one, may allow you to discard a challenge. Here we're told that we can discard this card from our hand to also discard a challenge, as long as it doesn't already have progress tokens on it. This simply means you pick one and send it directly to the face-down discard pile. You don't gain its reward, it's just removed, which is a good way to deal with a particularly tough one sometimes. And this open space will then be replaced at the end of the player's turn. Speaking of which, discarding this card from your hand at the start of your turn, to resolve its effect, does not take up your action for that turn. You will still be able to, for example, pick a challenge to attempt on your turn as usual. Speaking of which, let's look at this one. The reward for completing this one has an asterisk. This means the card text will explain how it works. When you see this symbol, it means you get to charge your lantern. Each seeker has a face-down lantern at the start of the game. When it's charged, you flip it face up. While charged, you can play it as an action in place of a skill card. So if I was attempting a challenge, I could use this lantern instead of playing a card from my hand. And these will have very powerful effects. 
For example, this one is white, so we know that means it can be played against a red, blue, or green challenge. And its ability says that while you don't roll the dice during this challenge, the card's value is equal to any number you want between 0 and 7. I'd probably pick 7. After using a lantern, flip it face down, meaning you won't be able to use it again until finding another way to charge it. With that, we've covered the main way to interact with well cards, attempt challenges against them. But there is another option. Sometimes a well card is labeled as an event. If you choose one of these to interact with, you simply read and resolve the text. In this case, the symbol we see here means you regain three health on the die, remembering that you can't have more health than the amount you started the game with. So just ignore any extra. Then it says to remove two progress from Callus and discard the event. Anytime you're instructed to remove progress from Callus, take it from the face down master card. And if you look at the text here, it says that if all of the progress on this card is removed before you reach the bottom of the well, you lose the game. Getting to the bottom of the well means having no cards left in this deck. So you don't want all of these progress tokens gone before that happens. We'll talk more about getting to the bottom of the well in a moment, but you might have noticed, at no point during a player's turn did I say that you automatically get to draw cards. This means that as turns are getting taken, and you play cards to attempt challenges, or to help perform boosts, you're going to slowly run out of cards in your hand. If you feel like you need more, then at the start of any of your turns, you have the option to exhaust yourself and draw new cards. And if you start your turn with no cards in your hand, then you must first exhaust yourself and draw new cards. To exhaust yourself, first discard all cards you have remaining in your hand, if any, to your personal discard pile. Then draw the top card of this exhausted deck. This will go face up into the play area and affect the game for both players from now on. For example, here we're told that each time a seeker suffers one or more health loss, they lose one extra. After revealing an exhausted card, you then draw cards from your deck until you have as many as you started the game with based on your number of players, which as we see here would be seven cards in a two-player game. Now, if you would ever run out of cards while drawing them from your deck, just shuffle your discard pile into a new one and then keep drawing anything that you were owed. If your deck and discard pile are ever both empty, then you just can't draw anything further. Also be aware, after exhausting, you then perform the rest of your turn as normal. In other words, when you exhaust, which happens at the start of your turn, you then take a full turn, attempting a challenge or resolving an event. I should also mention there's no limit to how many exhausted cards could end up in play, so as players exhaust more, you could have additional negative effects to deal with. And yes, these will always be negative. However, some don't stay in play when drawn. For example, this says, when drawn, you remove one progress from the master card, or five if you've reached the bottom of the well. Then this card is shuffled back into the exhausted deck. In this way, the exhausted deck will never truly run out. Okay, with that, we now know how to take turns. You can start by exhausting if you want to or have to. Then you either attempt a challenge or resolve an event from the four face-up cards surrounding the master's face-down card. Then after, you replace any of the four cards by the master that might have been removed. If at any point you need to draw a well card, but there are none left, you've reached the bottom of the well. You then remove any remaining well cards surrounding the master, and then flip the master card face up, leaving any progress tokens that were on it. Next, find the four double-sided gauntlet cards that have been put aside during the setup. These are now set in any order around the master with their challenge sides face up. To win the game, you just need to complete the challenge showing on the central master card. But you'll notice the master doesn't have a border matching red, green, or blue. This means none of those cards can be used in a challenge against it. And since white can only represent red, green, or blue, even it can't be used. This is where the gauntlet challenges come in. We can't directly go after the master yet, so we'll have to target these. These will have their own effects to pay attention to. For example, this says you skip rolling dice when attempting a challenge against this gauntlet. 
However, when you succeed, either through attempting challenges that put progress tokens on it, or by causing this to be discarded through another effect, you're then told to flip it over. While on this side, we see that the master is now vulnerable to blue actions. So now challenges can be made against him using blue cards or white ones used as blue. And just to be clear, gauntlet cards are never removed from play. Any effect that would discard one causes it to be flipped face down instead. Unless the gauntlet says otherwise. For example, this one cannot be targeted with a discard effect. You have to complete it by succeeding at challenge attempts. If you did succeed and flip this one over, well, now the master is vulnerable to red actions. If the master is ever vulnerable to more than one color, anytime you make a challenge attempt against it, you must first clearly declare which color challenge you're attempting, and then any action card played or boosts added must match that color. Notice that when attempting challenges against the master, it has an effect here that means anytime you roll this symbol on the die when attempting that challenge, you must resolve the indicated effect. In this case, you discard a card at random from your hand, and lose its value from your health. Here's another twist. As long as this gauntlet is face up, it says that you can't complete Callus's challenge. So even if you did add as much progress to the master's card as it requires, it won't be considered complete as long as this immortality gauntlet is face up. You'd need to ensure that this gauntlet is flipped face over first, removing that limitation. I should also mention, once the master has been flipped face up, any card effects that would cause you to interact with the well, for example, to delve deeper, are just ignored, because you'll stay on the final level of the well until you've either won or lost your battle against the master. Once the challenge on the master is complete, it's considered defeated, and the players all win. However, if at any point during the game, the player's health is ever reduced to zero, the game ends in an immediate loss. The players also lose if any other game effect says they do. To win, players will want to use their cards wisely and work together well, and this game is fully cooperative. Players can communicate as much as they like and even show each other their cards if they want to. But players should always be free to make their own decisions. And don't forget there's more than one version of the master in the box, so each time you play, you won't be quite sure which one you'll be facing. You'll also find a page of achievements you can attempt to complete while playing, marking them off on this page of the rulebook. There's also a handy player reference to remind you of the key steps of a turn and the terms you'll encounter while playing. And don't forget you can also pick up other sets to play on their own, which contain unique seekers and masters that can also be combined to play in up to three and four player games. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Kinfire Delve. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.